All right, yesterday we finished up talking about subatomic particles, and we said in the early 1900s we were able to figure out that atoms are made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons. The protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, the electrons kind of float outside the nucleus. And electrons don't really have very much mass, where protons and neutrons do. And we said that elements are defined by the number of protons that they have. That's how we identify them. However, the number of neutrons can change, and any time you do that, you're creating a new isotope, not all of which are found in nature, some of which are artificial or highly unstable or radioactive. And we went through and practiced elemental symbols. You saw that on the pod, and we looked at a really cool one, uh, plutonium-238 that's used to power spacecraft. All right, let's do a little bit of a warm-up, though. And we'll practice. And for this one, we're going to do deuterium. That's H2. And I want you to help me determine the number of protons, number of neutrons, the number of electrons, the mass number, and then the atomic number. I'll give you guys a minute to think about this, but check with your neighbor and see if you're getting the same answer as your neighbor for deuterium. All right, give me a thumbs up if you think you got it. All right, let's try this. So how many protons does hydrogen always have, regardless of its isotope? One. All right, in this case, how many neutrons must this have? One, right? Because we know the number of protons plus the number of neutrons equals the mass number. In this case, what's the mass number? Let's skip electrons. Two. What's the atomic number? One. So atomic number and protons are interchangeable, right? Mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons. All right, what about electrons? One. Assuming this is a neutral hydrogen atom. All right, let's try a harder one. Let's do chlorine 35, and this time it's a negative 1 charge for this chlorine, so I'm going to actually draw in a negative 1 symbol up here. All right, show thumbs if you think you got it. All right, so chlorine, how many protons does chlorine always have? 17, right? We look over there, it must always have 17 protons. Its atomic number is always going to be 17. All right, how many neutrons must it have? 18. We know its mass number is 35, so 35 minus 17 is 18. All right, now the tricky one, how many electrons? 18. Why 18 and not 17? Yeah, it has a negative one charge, which means it has one extra electron. We know electrons have a negative charge, which is why it's going more negative. And so in this case, it has one extra electron. This happens occasionally where elements will gain or lose electrons. So I'm going to make a little note here. If an atom gains or loses an electron, it is called what? Does anybody know? An ion. So an ion just means it has either extra electrons or not enough electrons. I went to a health food store recently and it cracked me up because I saw some water there that was being advertised as ionized water. I'm like, what does that even mean? Um, are you adding electrons to this water? It's, I don't know. There's a lot of health food gimmicks involving ions that are good or bad for you. Some ions are essential for biological mechanisms. Others are quite poisonous. It's not universally good. You get the water. I didn't get the water. <laughs> All right, next one, 238. Uranium. This is the natural uranium that's found in deposits all over the world. 
This isn't the uranium used for making some types of atomic bombs. The uranium that's used for making atomic weapons is 235. <laughs> However, most atomic weapons are not made with uranium. They're made with... All right, let's try this one. So uranium, how many protons does uranium have? 92. All right, how many neutrons must it have? 146. How many electrons must it have, assuming it's neutral? 92. Mass number? 238. And atomic number? 92. So it's important to remember that atomic number and protons are interchangeable. All right, one last one, just because I think it's interesting. This is cesium-137. This is a byproduct from nuclear reactors. How many of you uh, read or saw in the news reports about Fukushima after the earthquake over there? This was actually released from Fukushima. It's really nasty stuff. The problem with it is it has a half-life of 30 years, so it takes 30 years for half of it to break down. And it's water soluble, which means some of that cesium-137 is actually being picked up in the oceans around Fukushima, and it's very problematic. Um, prior to the first atomic bomb, this was not present in our environment, so it's actually um, a big contaminant of steel, and um, it's radioactive, and it gets all over. So let's start with this one. All right, so how many protons does cesium have? 55. How many neutrons? 82. How many electrons? 55. Mass number? 137. And atomic number? 55. So with Fukushima, one of the big problems right now that isn't really being talked about in the news is they're pretty confident the reactor melted down. When a nuclear reactor melts down, it gets really, really, really hot. So hot, it will actually start vaporizing the metal. And you don't want vaporized radioactive isotopes going up into the atmosphere. That's a big problem. So what they're doing right now is they're trying to flood the melted down reactor with water. The problem with doing that is the water that you put in then becomes radioactive. And what do you do with it? They don't have a good plan on what to do with it. So they just pump it out into a storage tank. They have to build new storage tanks on a weekly basis to capture all of that water. And at what point do we run out of space for storage tanks? Unclear. The other problem that they had was a lot of the water that they were pumping in was actually leaking out through the ground and ending up in the ocean and in the local community. You don't want radioactive water in your local community. And so what they had to figure out was some way of keeping the water from seeping out from the reactor. And it was ingenious. What they did was they actually drilled holes kind of all around the reactor, just hole after hole after hole after hole, almost like, pence, or almost like uh, fence holes all the way around. They stuck pipes down, I want to say like over 100 feet, and then they filled the pipes with refrigerant, and they ended up creating a 100-foot wall of permafrost around the entire facility so that the water couldn't get out. It is a huge environmental problem, it's a huge engineering problem, and it's unclear what they're going to do to fix it. Right now they're just putting band-aid over band-aids over band-aids over band-aids. Um, but it's an interesting situation, and I encourage you to read up about it if you're interested in that sort of um, stuff. All right, fun thought experiment. Other kind of funny side story is they keep on sending in robots to take pictures of the reactors and the robots get fried from the radiation and so there's this trail of dead robots going to the reactor it's kind of funny all right thought experience <laughs> it's a robot graveyard all right let's figure out what this element is it's got mass number of 52 we need to figure this out and then what I want us to do is after we figure out what this element is, we'll do a thought experiment about what happens if you slam this with a proton and what happens if you remove a proton. So I'll do minus P plus. What does... Okay. So what do you think this element is? What is the symbol that's the question mark? CR. Does anybody know what CR is? Chromium. So we put CR, that's chromium. It's atomic number 52. 
has 24 protons, right? All right, if we slam this with a proton, let's say in a particle accelerator, we would put in one more proton, so this would be 25. What would happen to the mass number? It would go up one, right? So it'd be 53. Now what would this be? So if we go over there, it'd be manganese, Mn, not to be confused with magnesium, which is Mg, okay? And do we have any charge here? It would have to be positive one, right? Because we put in a positive charge. We didn't add in any electrons there. So in this case, this would be an ion, right? Okay, what happens if we remove a proton? Well, then we'd go down to atomic number 23. Mass number would also have to drop one. So this would be 51. And then if we look at the periodic table, atomic number of 23 would be vanadium, element V. All right, and then what would the charge be here? Negative one, because we removed one of the positive charges. So do watch out for addition or removal of protons or electrons, because that can change the overall charge. All right, let's try another one. This one, we've got 93, got 38. And again, we don't know this elemental symbol right away, but let's try to figure that out. And then what I'm going to do is add in a neutron. It's rounding them. 30, or sorry, uh, 38, yep. This would be atomic number 38 and 93. All right. Is it still going to be the same element if we blast it with a neutron? Yeah, absolutely. We aren't changing the number of protons, which is how we define elements. Oops. Yeah. So it'd still be SR. What happens to the mass number? It goes up one, right? What about the charge? It stays the same, right? Neutrons don't have a charge, so we aren't going to change the charge of this. All right, what's the relationship between these? Not isomers, close. Isotopes, right? Isotopes are elements that differ in the number of uh, neutrons that they have. Does that make sense? All right, so let's switch gears. We're going to look at symbolic representations of atoms. And again, I've got a good video. We get to learn chemistry from dogs. Specifically, she's referring to mass. Good job, guys. Yellow man is helium. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. That video makes me very happy. All right. <laughs> my, my dog would clearly not be capable of doing that video. Um, I do have a link on here uh, to a FET site. Has anybody ever used FET in their high school? I don't think it's that popular in high schools yet, but it's really neat. And in this website, they have an atom builder, an isotope builder. So for example, we can try to build an atom. If you click on this, you can say, all right, I'm going to drop in, let's say, two protons. 
and then neutron, I've made helium, right? It'll actually help you with this. You can also open this up and it'll tell you the charge. For example, helium in this case, we have two protons in there. However, we don't have any electrons, so it has a net charge of positive two. It's got a mass number of three because it's got three things in the nucleus. And then you can say, well, what happens if I drop in three electrons? Oh, now our net charge is now negative one. I could take one of these, pull it out, net charge is zero. So it's kind of a fun interactive tutorial if you want to play around with it. The other thing I really like about this is if you drop in too many neutrons, or maybe it's not this one. Oh yeah, you have to click the unstable. It'll actually show it vibrating, saying it's unstable. Quite often, if you have too many neutrons, the atom becomes unstable and radioactive. So it's a neat uh, visual representation of that. All right, so let's practice a little bit just drawing visual representations. I know this is review. Oh. Let's draw lithium-6. Sorry, my six doesn't look very good. And I'm going to color code it. Let's do black dots equal neutrons. Red dots equal protons. And blue dots are going to equal electrons. So we're just going to do a simple visual representation of what this element must look like. So we know it's going to take up some sort of space. All right, so how many protons does lithium always have? Have to be three, right? It's atomic number of three. So I just go ahead and I do three dots. We know that protons are located in the nucleus, in the center of the atom, so I'm going to cluster them tightly together. How many neutrons must it have? Three. So again, I would cluster this tightly in here. And I'm just going to label this as a nucleus. And how many electrons must this have, considering there's no charge shown? It must have three. The interesting thing with these electrons is they don't want to really be near the nucleus, even though they have opposite charges. They kind of float around in this cloud of electrons around the nucleus. Does that make sense? We'll do one more, just for practice. Let's do, actually, sorry, I'm going to change this. Um, let's do F18. with a negative charge. So I'll say F18, negative 1. This is a really neat element. F18 is um, created artificially, and they're using it lately to tag these pharmaceutical drugs, and what they do is they give people these tagged drugs, stick them in an MRI and see where the drugs go in their brain, and it causes your brain to light up um, in the fMRI. It's really interesting for medicinal chemistry. Okay, so let's draw this one. All right, how many protons must there be? Nine. So I'd say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, something like that. And how many neutrons? Nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And again, I'd say all of these are clustered in the nucleus. All right, how many electrons? Ten, right? We've got a negative charge, which means we must have one more electron than proton. So I'll just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I don't like that. Make sense? All right. Let's move on to more interesting stuff. <laughs> so that attaches the anything? Any drugs? So what they do is fluorine is really tiny. It doesn't change the overall size of a pharmaceutical drug. And so what they do is they'll swap it off for some other hydrogen, let's say. And the problem is, this only exists for about, I think, 100 minutes. So they have to really quickly put it on a drug, give it to a human. Let's say it's a psychiatric drug. They'll see where the drug goes in the brain, and it will cause the brain to light up on the fMRI. It's really interesting. 
Right now, a lot of our pharmaceutical drugs, we know that they work. We don't know how they work. Um, brain chemistry is just not well understood yet, and that's why they're trying to do a lot of these studies. Yeah. All right, so let's talk more about these electrons. And I'm going to redo lithium-6 again. So lithium-6, we said, has three protons. And it has three pro or neutrons. And we said this is our nucleus, so I'm going to just circle that. The reality is not all electrons are created equal. So for example, these electrons right here are in one area around the nucleus. And then your second electron, or sorry, third electron, is going to be sticking out here. So you've got this cloud of electrons floating around. This inner cloud are called inner shell electrons. These are not very reactive. They're nice and stable because they're closer to the nucleus. Out here, we've got these outer shell electrons. And these are also known as valence electrons. So we are going to use this term a lot. Valence electrons are only the outer shell electrons. And these tend to be reactive. So it's pretty easy to identify the number of valence electrons you have, and I'll show you that later. But I did want to get into a few nitty gritty details about where these electrons are located. And electrons occupy a 3D space. It's not 2D, obviously, it's more of a sphere. Called an orbital. Let me slide this over. All right, and this does get confusing. It is not like a planet's orbit. If you think about our planets, right, constantly is going around the same ellipse or circle. Electrons don't do that. Electrons are very strange little particles. They're so light, they almost behave like light. Um, and so they have properties of both a particle and a wave. And because of that, they don't really follow any of Newton's laws in the same way we would anticipate them. So instead, when I'm talking about an orbital, what I'm really talking about is a probability map. of an electron's location. And there's a bunch of different orbital types, but we're just going to focus on two. The first one is the easiest. And this is an s orbital. And an s orbital is basically a sphere. Can't really draw it very well on a board, but you can get the idea that it's a three dimensional sphere. And basically, it's saying there's a probability that an electron is going to be somewhere within the sphere shaped location, right? OK. The next one is a little bit different. And I'm going to draw this out using Cartesian coordinates. And so we've got essentially our y-axis here, our x-axis here, and then the z is going in and out. And for this one, it looks more like a dumbbell, like that. 
This is a p orbital. And it's a dumbbell shaped. At the center of this dumbbell, that red dot, we call that a node. There's very little probability that the electrons will be there. Instead, they want to be located in these lobes sticking out in the sides like that. Alternatively, what you can have is another orbital that's also the same shape, but this time, instead of going straight up and down, it's going along the x-axis. This is also a p-orbital. And last but not least, oops, you can have one that's going along the z-axis, so going in and out of the page. Looks more like this. And this is also a p orbital. OK, so there's three different p orbitals. They're all oriented differently in space. But there are three different types of them. The other thing I wanted to note is that each orbital can only hold two electrons. What I mean by that is this s orbital, you can fit two electrons in here. This p orbital, you can fit two electrons in here. This p orbital, you can fit another two electrons. And then this p orbital, you can fit another two electrons. So if we think about p orbitals, how many total electrons can they hold? Six. Six. But it requires all three of them to participate in holding those electrons. All right. Niels, Niel Bohr in the early 1900s was studying this and trying to figure out what was going on. And he came up with a really important idea. And he basically said, once an orbital is filled with two electrons, the next electrons must occupy a different orbital. So they have to find a new home. And then the other interesting offshoot of this is if no equal energy orbital is available, electrons must occupy a higher energy orbital. It makes sense to us, but at the time there was some debate about whether or not orbitals existed, whether or not electrons were just simply orbiting atoms, and how electrons behaved. And this model is referred to as the quantum model. So I'll describe to you what the quantum model is. And there's an analogy that I like to use that involves stairs. So let's imagine that we've got some electrons. We can fit an electron here, an electron here. But we can only fit two electrons on any given step, right? Once we're out of room on this step, the next electrons can go up here and occupy the next highest step, and so on. The big takeaway from this was electrons can't be halfway up a step. And the interesting thing with this, the way they were able to deduce this, was they would take one of these electrons, for example this one, and they would excite it with a bunch of energy. And when you excite it, it goes up here, for example, to maybe one of the higher energy steps. And then once it's on that step, 
It's not very happy being here. It's at a high energy level. It immediately wants to go back down to its old home. And when it does that, it ends up releasing light in many situations. And so what they did was excite electrons up to a higher energy orbital, watch them relax back down. And what they saw was they only got certain types of light. They didn't get the entire color spectrum. They only got certain colors. And so they're able to determine, well, because of that, there must be discrete steps or energy levels that these um, electrons occupy. It gets really complicated. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I did want to introduce it to you guys. All right, so let's make some notes. There are specific energy levels. that electrons occupy. That's the first thing. And then electrons can't be between different energy levels. Does that make sense? So the quantum theory is just basically saying there's steps. Electrons have to occupy one of those energy steps. <laughs> make sense? All right. Now, another question linking back to the valence electron idea. Which of these electrons are our valence electrons? Is it going to be the bottom step or the next step up? Next step up, exactly. So going back to that same idea, we previously said that valence electrons reside in the highest energy orbitals. They've got a lot more potential energy in this example. All right, so I'll show you a cool trick for determining the number of valence electrons residing in the highest energy orbitals. But in order to do that, we've got to create a periodic table. So I'm going to make a condensed one. What I do is I chart it out and then I say 1a. If you look at our periodic table, you see in the top, very, very top left hand corner, 1a. And then next to that, we've got 2a. It's Roman numerals. And then I'm going to skip over to 3a over here. And we'll have 4a, 5a, 6a. 7a, and last but not least, we've got 8a. Okay, so those are our main columns, and I'm going to start filling these in with some elements. So for example, in column one, we've got hydrogen, lithium, sodium, etc., going all the way down. In group 2a, we've got beryllium, we've got magnesium, and we keep on going down. And then in between here, I'm going to skip these. These are all the transition metals. So we're going to ignore those for right now. They're not that important for us. And then next column over, we've got boron and aluminum. We've got carbon and silicon. We've got nitrogen and phosphorus. We've got oxygen and sulfur. We've got fluorine and chlorine. We've got helium, neon, and argon. And I'm not going to fill out the whole thing, but you get the idea, right? Nice and simple periodic table. Easiest thing to do is to say, all right, this one has one valence electron. What do you think group two has? 
Two? That's convenient. What do you think group three has? Three? <laughs> group four has four. Group five has five. Group six has six. Group seven has seven. And group eight has eight. So it's nice and simple to determine number of valence electrons. All right. However, there's a bit more to it, so I did want to clarify. <coughs> this works really well for neutral atoms. So for neutral atoms, your main group number equals number of valence electrons. So like I said, the main group number was the thing I wrote in red at the top of the column. It's the Roman numerals on the very top. That tells you your number of valence electrons. Nice and simple for neutral atoms. For charged atoms, it gets a bit more complicated. All right, and for charged atoms, what you do is take your main group number minus your charge, and this equals your number of valence electrons. So let's do an example of this. And for the first one, we'll do fluorine with a negative charge. So I'll just do fluorine with a little negative charge there. It's assumed to be negative one if number is not shown. All right, what's its main group number? Yep, so its main group number is seven. Its charge, in this case, is negative one. So what happens when we have a subtraction of a negative number? It becomes a positive, right? That's one thing a lot of students forget, is a negative of a negative is a positive. So this one would have eight valence electrons. All right, let's try another one really quick. One more and then we're done. The magnesium two plus. What's the main group number for magnesium? Two. And it's charged this time is positive two, not a negative number, so we don't have to worry about that switching of signs. So how many valence electrons would there be? Yeah, two minus two, hopefully we can all do that in our head. That's zero valence electrons. All right, so that's where we're gonna leave it today. Um, make sure next week, uh, that you start preparing for your exam early and don't put it off until later in the week, specifically unit conversions. If you are struggling with unit conversions, you may want to schedule time to meet with me or go to the WTC. Have a good weekend.